Dr. Virgil to make a statement. He will be followed by Dr. Ramsamy, and then I will open the floor for questioning. Bishop Virgil. Thank you very much. Thursday, November 7th. Proof to all of Guyana that the tenth parliament could be best described as Carl Greenwich Part Two, aided and abetted by David Granger and the members of the APNU with lead supporting rules from Mr. Kemraj Ramtatan and Mr. Moses Nagamutu of the AFC. Why do I say it can be best described as Carl Greenwich Part 2? Part 1. Carl Greenwich Part 1 is the years when the Honorable Member took this country down a dark path of gloom and doom. The PPPC, through its hard work, deliberate and decisive actions, brought this country back into a place of progress, prosperity, and development for all Guyanese. And I want to emphasize all Guyanese, because even members or persons who would have supported in the past the PNC, now disguised as the APNU, are beneficiaries of the progressive nature of the policies and programs that have been initiated and implemented by the PPPC. A rejection of the countering of financing of terrorism and the anti-money laundering bill on Thursday was really a rejection of all those who called for its enactment. On the floor of the National Assembly, I made a passionate appeal to members of the opposition, indicating, number one, when we are elected as representatives of the people and we take our oath of office as members of parliament, we are there to represent the people of Guyana, not to represent our own interests or special interests, but the people of Guyana. The people of Guyana has spoken as it relates to this bill and why it needs to be enacted we started out with the Private Sector Commission, a body that comprises all of the major organizations that form the economic sector of this country, whether it be manufacturers, aircraft owners, the hospitality section, all 17 organizations, the bankers, Association, the Insurance Association of Guyana, the Rice Producers Association of Guyana. The largest block that represents workers, the FITUG, called for the enactment of this legislation. So we had the private sector, the employers, we had the labor union representing the workers, ordinary working class people. And I don't believe anybody in Guyana can deny that the FITUG represents the largest block of workers in this country. We had the Rice Producers Association, 
which represents the largest group of rice farmers, and we would have seen how well they have been contributing to national development and the economy, surpassing 500 tons of rice this year, contributing towards the development of our economy. We had the Aircraft Owners Association telling that they, they rely on spare parts that have to be ordered and gotten to Guyana swiftly and uh, to ensure that we have proper legislation and the financial architecture to ensure the speedy resolution of the transformed movement of money is important for them. But more than that, we had ordinary Guyanese. Ordinary Guyanese, the man and woman in the street who, having listened to the debate that was played out in the press, called for agreement and enactment of this piece of legislation, which would have prevented Guyana from being backlisted. And still, the APNU and the AFC voted to prevent the passage of this bill then the question must be asked, and I put the question to you again. The APNU, Mr. Carl Greenwich, Mr. David Granger, and their band must tell the people of Guyana whose interests they were representing when they voted last Thursday. Mr. Ramjatan and Mrs. Mr. Nagamutu must explain to the people of Guyana whose interests they were representing. I can tell you, it couldn't be the interests of the formal and organized private sector. It couldn't be the interests of the workers of Guyana. It couldn't be the interests of the ordinary rural farmer. It couldn't be the interests of the man in the street. It couldn't be the interests of the youth and the young professionals of this country. They must now tell us whose interests they were representing. Their actions can be best described as a betrayal of monumental proportions. A betrayal of monumental proportions that will have serious, damaging, and adverse effects on this nation. The 10th Parliament has been hailed as a place that will promote and push and foster collaboration and cooperation among the people of Guyana. His Excellency, the President of Guyana, has initiated active and aggressive collaboration and cooperation and consultation with the opposition. He of himself, at a press conference immediately following the non-passage of this legislation, has had to indicate he will have to re-examine his relationship with the opposition. This is a, a serious issue that cannot go unattended. It was an unashamed display of the disrespect for the Guyanese people. They diss the Guyanese people. And that includes even persons who supported them at the last election. But more than that, the callous heckling that came from members of the opposition also displayed a naked attempt to bully the government, a naked attempt to bully the government. We cannot have the politics of bullyism in the August House. The, the, the National Assembly is not a place for bullyism. The National Assembly is a place for debate, deliberation, and decision making. It's not using your one seat majority to bully and to have your way, because all of this was happening in a framework that we have a deadline to meet. And I sat as a member of this Parliamentary Special Select Committee. And I want to assure members of the public, it was always the game plan of the opposition 
to kill this bill. It was always their game plan. They showed no real interest in getting the amendments made. So to come now to say that they wanted further amendments, I concur with the views expressed by my colleague, Dr. Ashni Singh. It was another attempt for delay. It was another attempt for delay. The people of Guyana must know that more time was spent discussing the date and time of meeting than the actual work of the bill by the opposition. And I offered to them, if you cannot meet frequently, let us commit whenever we meet to at least do four hours of work. So if we meet from 4.30, we can do four hours until 8.30. It will compensate that you don't have to come several times in a week because we would have done several hours of work and get the bill moving. They were not interested. So to come to the floor and to talk about a recommitment of the bill to this parliamentary special select committee because they had concerns and they want to have amendments was just blowing hot air. The, attempt, the, the actual plot was to ensure that Guyana misses the deadline of November 18. And once we miss that deadline, for Guyana to be able to face the necessary sanctions, which was best described by His Excellency himself, the worst case of economic sabotage. So I'll pause here for now. Thanks. Doc. Th thank you very much. Served in the 7th, 8th, 9th, and now the 10th Parliament. I have also followed all of the happenings in our parliament, in the sixth parliament, and prior to the sixth parliament, before 1992. I must say that since 1992, when we look at the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth parliament, the tenth parliament is the most obstructionist of all the parliaments. The tenth parliament seemed to work on the notion that it is the work of the opposition to obstruct every effort to improve and to build on our participatory democracy. On Thursday, two things became clear to me. First of all, the, public, the private sector commission attempted to present their views formally to the members of Parliament of Guyana. The ability for the public to speak to their parliamentarian is a fundamental right. There is always this mistake that Parliament is only for the people's representatives to speak, to speak to themselves and speak to the people. But a Parliament is a democratic institution where not only are the people's representatives speaking, but the people themselves speak. The people speak in Parliament, one, through their representatives. Every time one of us speak, we are supposed to be speaking on behalf of the people, not on our own behalf, but on behalf of the people. Since 1992, we have expanded the use of the Special Select Committee. The Special Select Committee, which was rarely, if ever, used before 1992, has been increasingly used since 1992. And indeed, virtually every major bill in the 8th and ninth Parliament, and now in the 10th Parliament, go to Special Select Committee. The procedures of the Special Select Committee allow the members of Parliament to bring in the public so individuals and organizations can come and speak to the parliamentarians to directly reflect their views and recommendations. A third mechanism where the public speak to their members of Parliament is through a mechanism called a petition. 
One will recall when the medical termination for pregnancy bill was brought forward in the early 1990s. Several organizations, including the church, presented petitions. Petitions are not just letters. They are statements that are read in the parliament on behalf of the petition. The, the clerk of the National Assembly read it out so everybody hears it, the public hears it. During the presentation in 2006 of the gambling and casino bill, the church leaders presented a petition. Earlier this year, all of us here will recall that the staff, some members of the staff of the University of Guyana presented a petition that was read on the floor of the National Assembly. In all those instances, most members of parliament was not in a, were not in agreement with the sentiments in those petitions. But petitions are not presented because the majority or all of the members of parliament agree with it or not. It is a right of the citizens to present those petitions. There are rules in how it should be and the clerk of the National Assembly determined. And once those rules are adhered to, whether members of parliament agree with it or not, they are read. Anytime a petition is presented in accordance with the rules and the parliament prevent its presentation, it's a sabotage of our democracy. It is a restriction on freedom of speech. It is denying freedom of expression. So the issue is not whether the private sector commission presented views and recommendations that were in accordance with the majority of the members of parliament. That is not a criteria to preserve the ancient and fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression. The fact that the private sector commission may have made recommendation and a request that were not in accordance with the views of the members of the opposition is immaterial. What is material is that they have a right to present a petition. The parliament could act on those recommendations or reject those recommendations but you have to allow them to present it. It was perhaps the first time in the history of Guyana, including in the dictatorial years, that a group was prevented from exercising a fundamental right. And I think the PPP Civic would want to highlight the fact that the people who denied freedom in this country for almost three decades, today in opposition, is demonstrating that their natural inclination is to subvert freedom and democracy. And I hope that no one misses that signal and a concrete way that even in opposition, the MPs from APNU, which is the PNC, and the MPs from AFC did Ghana a major disservice. It's a, a day of infamy for Ghana that we would seek to reduce people's freedom. My second point has to do with whether, in fact, the MPs of APNU and AFC ever had any intention to support the interest of Guyana. They, 
bill to amend the Anti-Money uh, anti Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Act was one that brought Guyana into compliance with international rules and regulations. The 2007 bill made provisions to bring Guyana's anti-money laundering laws and counter-terrorism acts into compliance with international rules. The 2013 amendment was to further strengthen the compliance with international rules. It was determined that the amendments made would have satisfied CFAT's rules and regulations. This is the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. And therefore, no one can accuse the government of trying to have rules and regulations in Guyana that was not in compliance with international rules. This bill was presented for the first time earlier this year, I believe in April of this year. The opposition requested that the bill be sent to a special select committee. The government readily agreed for that bill to be sent to the special select committee. There were 17 meetings of the special select committee. The members of APNU and of AFC attended only 50% of those meetings. Indeed, some members that are most vociferous, like Mr. Kemraj Ramjatan. Mr. Kemraj Ramjatan attended seven of 17 meetings. That is less than half of the meetings. The PPP civic members attended 81% of the meetings in terms of total attendance. So that when you look at the attendance to the special select committee meetings that the opposition demanded, it demonstrated that there was never an intent to complete the work of the special select committee. You will recall that earlier in May or June, we had a deadline, a deadline that we had to make a request for an extension. Again, in July, we had an extension to the deadline, a deadline that was given in this case to November. We worked diligently to pass, to, to have the work of the select committee so that we could have pass this bill and have it assented before the deadline. We did so in the interest of Guyana. We don't mind working many more months and many more years on this bill, but we have to complete the work. Members of parliament are put there by the people to do their business. We mustn't do this business at our behest, we must do it in a timely fashion. If you are sent to represent your media house at a press briefing of the PPP and you decide you will come, but you'll come when you're ready and when you want to, see what will happen. The people of Guyana put us there to do our job, not to just go and talk to infinity and that's what we were attempting to do. Now, I, this is the point I want to make. 
because they claim at that point that they were still ready to pass the bill if we would only allow them some more time. When the report of the select committee was presented, which means that the bill would have been passed a second time, it goes to a third reading. At the third reading, no motion, no amendment, or so can be made. But prior to it being approved, that is the report of the Special Select Committee, a member of the opposition could have requested that it not be approved at that point and that the Special Select Committee continues its work. There was no question as to whether the PPPC would have allowed them to do so, because the PPPC would not have had the numerical numbers to stop that from happening. The opposition, with their 33 members in the House, had the numerical advantage to not approve the report and to recommit the report to the Special Select Committee. They chose not to do so. You might say, and some members of the public might say, that they didn't know they could do that. But you have people like Mr. Carl Greenwich, who served in the 4th, 5th, parliaments of Guyana and before. You have people like my colleague and friend, Dr. Rupert Rupnerain, who served in many parliaments. You have Mr. Moses Nagamutu and Kemraj Ramjatan. You have Amna Ali. You have Volda Lawrence. You have the Deputy Speaker of the House who must know all of the rules of parliament, because that's why you are the deputy speaker of the house. They did not exercise that option they had. Let us concede, therefore, that they made a mistake, and it was not an intentional thing. When they moved, attempted to move for a recommittal in the third reading, it was a procedural abnormality and not allowable. The speaker pointed that out to them. But the speaker did not move directly to put the question that the bill be read a third time. Because the speaker was giving them time to move the suspension of the standing order, because that was the only way a motion could have been moved to recommit the bill. Instead, Mr. Greenwich sought to filibuster, making all kinds of statements without moving for the suspension of the standing order. The speaker adjourned the meeting. And at that point, they were told that if they want, seriously want to recommit, well, they could move the suspension of the standing order. But even before that, during the filibustering, they knew, I know they knew, because there were communications between several of them, and that is the technology, and members of the PPPC. Because you see, we, were, we, we had our hands tied to our backs. Because we can't move that notion. We are trying to pass a bill. 
we presented a report that the House approved unanimously. The House did not reject it. The House approved it unanimously. Nobody said they were opposed to the report of the Special Select Committee. And therefore, it is incumbent on the government to move in accordance with the rules to the third reading. After the adjournment, Mr. Basil Williams meekly attempted to move a motion to suspend the standing order. But when requested to say why you are moving the suspension, I'm, I'm moving you step by step because you can't move a suspension of the standing order without saying what you want the suspension of the standing order for. Is it to move a suspension so that all of us could go to some party? Is it to move a suspension so that we all could move in unison over to whatever the place is on the other side where you could eat or drink? Is it to move the standing order so we could go home and have a bath and come back? Is it to move a, sta a suspension of the standing order to recommit the bill? They weren't saying. And when requested to do so, Mr. Basil Williams says he withdraw. And at that point, the bill had to be put to the third reading for approval. They voted against it. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is that there was never an intent to pass the bill. It was, as the president said, an effort at economic sabotage. Every time this government tries to protect the interests and promote the interests of the people of Guyana and of our country, the opposition have stood in the path of those developments. I'm not going to talk about all the projects, Amila, etc. But I'm going to remind you that in accordance with international rules and regulation, and in accordance with international obligation, Guyana voted at the United Nations to eliminate the trafficking of illicit arms and ammunition. Earlier this year, the government of Guyana sought to include those obligations at the United Nations in our laws. The opposition voted against the amendment in order to eliminate small arms and ammunition. Who benefit from action like voting against the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Act? Who benefits when you refuse to limit and eliminate small arms and ammunition and trafficking in arms and ammunition? It's criminals. It's drug dealers. It's money launderers. Who, whose side we stand on? Because this amendment and the previous amendment with the trafficking of arms and ammunition, illicit arms and ammunition, were in the interests of the people and the nation. It was directly targeting the criminals, in this case, the opposition has openly, not what I say, not accusing anybody, I'm not speculating. Because when you vote against those things, you vote in favor of the criminals and against the nation. The both of these amendment bills, when were voted on, 
was on a division. The names of the people who voted against trafficking of arms and ammunition are clear. David Granger, Rupert Rupnarine, Amna Ali, Volga Lawrence, Debbie Baca, Basil Williams, David Harmon, Joe Harmon, Greenwich, Ramjatan, Nagamutu. The names of the people who voted so that we can eliminate trafficking of arms and ammunition. The, the names of the people who voted so that we could adhere to the rules and regulations to prevent money laundering and to prevent terrorism, to counter terrorism, are people like Prime Minister Sam Hines, Gail Teixeira, Juan Hedgel, Leslie Ramsamy, Ashni Singh. These are the people who voted so that we can preserve law and order, that we can promote freedom and democracy. The people of Guyana know the truth because our words and our, more importantly, our actions speak very loudly. Thank you. Thanks. Question? Two questions. One um, has to do with the point that you guys have raised about, and, and both um, Dr. Ramsamy, about, about the opposition obstructing progress and that kind of thing. And the President has said in his press conference that he has to re-examine his relationship with the opposition. And we know that all of this is important in moving ahead any proper agenda for development. Um, there was a, a thought of, of possible snap elections as a consequence because how else can we move forward? What is the party's position on that? And Bishop Edel, you sat on the special select committee and the, key, the APNU had said that um, its submissions were not included in the report um, that it made at, at whatever meetings it attended. Um, and it talked too about a memorandum by the Guyana Bar Association and Professor Clyde Thomas' submissions being denied. Can you respond to that? Yes. What are their submissions? There was none. No member of the APNU on the Parliamentary Select Committee or any other member or any entity claiming to be a representative of the APNU made any submissions. By public notice, by public notice, members of the public special interest organizations and letters were written to which forms part of the report Indiv individuals and organizations to come and appear before the special select committee a deadline was given by which they should respond they did not respond but listen to the actions of the opposition you come to parliament a few days before parliament goes into recess and you suspend the meeting of the committee until the end of the recess, which is October. During that period where the deadline of submissions from entities and individuals was passed, a missive came from the Bar Association, signed by Mr. Christopher Ram, suggesting that maybe we should look at some things, no concrete proposals, no suggested amendments for inclusion, but he would like to have discussions. That's the Bar Association. Professor Clive Thomas sends in a submission of several pages that had nothing to do with the proposed amendments, but he was dealing with the principal act. He was dealing with the principal act. The deadline is already passed. This is October. Ms. Gail Teixeira, the chair, chairperson of that parliamentary special select committee, convened sittings of the select committee as soon as the recess was over because we knew we wanted to expedite the work. Parliament hadn't met, but the parliamentary special select committee was meeting. 
when we're supposed to consider how we will treat with these two pieces that came before us after the deadline, which was the submission of the Bar Association and that which came from Professor Crank Thomas, you absented yourself from the meetings. What is the intent? You want to keep the discussions at the level of the select committee going on and on and on and on. But you know something? My colleagues put it to the test, even on the floor, while we had the recess, uh, when, the, when the speaker called for the adjournment. After the APNU asked for this matter to be recommitted to the special select committee for the consideration of their views and other views, we asked them, could you make a commitment to a time frame? We are prepared to meet tomorrow, Friday. We could meet Monday, we could meet Tuesday, and we could get back into Parliament this week and pass the legislation so that it could be acceptable to everybody. So we were prepared by way of negotiation and discussions. You know what? Let the people of Guyana know. They were not willing to say and to commit to a timeline, which meant it, 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 bas it basically full satisfied what we were always seeing. They wanted to ensure that it kept going on and on and on and on so that we miss the deadline so that Guyana faces the economic consequences and the hardships that will flow from being blacklisted. So all these submissions that came belatedly way months after the deadline was just a ploy to wave something in the front of the people of Guyana and say, look, we had people who wanted to appear but they didn't get to appear. Why didn't you respond before? There was public advertisement in the newspapers. The media houses carried that the special select committee was meeting. Persons were called to make submissions. And now you're coming belatedly saying, look, but we would like to be heard. But the, Mr. Basil Williams repeatedly said, I have some concerns. And the chairperson kept saying, put them in writing. Make your submissions. Up to all the noises that were made on the floor, he has not produced not even one line, a paragraph, or a page. What are his concerns? If you meet the APNU, or a representative of the APNU in a bar, or on the side of the road and ask them, what are your concerns? Today they will tell you something else. Tomorrow they will say something else. Every day they're changing the goalposts. You know why? They don't know what are their concerns. Because the real ploy was to keep this thing in parliamentary special select committee to delay it getting to the deadline. That was their intent. So I will just respond to them. Well, they weren't even rejected. Okay, what happened to it, it, it was not even considered. It came late. And while that submission was made, we agreed that at the next meeting, we will plot the way forward of how we will deal with it. The APNU never showed up. Well, we, we already had a position. The time for submissions were passed. The time for submissions were passed. And you we were prepared to have discussions on how we go forward. You should know that if, if you know the procedures of the select committee and the presentation of reports to the House, nothing is left out. Because you need to be aware of this. One, no meeting is proceeded with unless the meetings of the previous minute uh, of the previous meeting minutes were considered and approved so, and those minutes are part of the record that are presented to the national assembly for approval so that even if you didn't make a written report if you made a written report all documents are included as part of the report but if it is that you are claiming that something you said was not included. It's in the minutes of the proceedings, and therefore that is presented to Parliament. It's not just a two or three page report that is presented to Parliament. It is the complete report 
including verbatim presentations, so that the claim is just a ruse to fool people that their, their suggestions were not taken into consideration. Even if I make a suggestion at the Special Select Committee, it is up to me to present what are the amendments I would like to have. In the National Assembly, there are rules. The Speaker has articulated those rules that if you want to amend a bill, you should present that amendment in writing. The Speaker would allow amendments on the floor, but substantive amendments that are predetermined, and we know that they have been talking about amendments since April. So it wasn't like this amendment arose on the floor. Those amendments were never presented for the consideration in the Special Select Committee or for the consideration during a previous debate or during the presentation of the report last Thursday. So that we have to consider what people say sometimes because they believe they could say these things and people will just simply accept it because people don't know the rules and the truth. And in this case, the truth is very evident. On snap elections, that would be up to the PPP executive, that would be up to the government. The government of Guyana at some point will have to decide whether it can continue doing its work effectively and in the interest of the people of Guyana. And at that point, the government and the party will have to decide on a way forward. I'm not in a position to pronounce on that. Could we can't hear you. I think the elections were held on November the 28th, 2011. And the people of Guyana decided the numbers. The numbers is that a combination of APNU MPs and AFC MPs account for 33 members in the parliament. And the PPPC by itself account for 32 members. I think the regular math program says 33 is one more than 32. Because basically we believe that the opposition should be considered a partner in national development. And the fact that we believe that this bill is something of national interest, in as much as we don't have 33 votes, we put it to the parliament because we believe that the opposition must act responsibly and be a partner. And it is clear that they, they cannot be trusted as a partner for national development. Let, let me just, um, that, that's one answer. But there is a procedural answer that I thought I took my time to go through. The parliament is not a place where you just jump up and speak. It works with rules. The rules is that one, the report of the special select committee is presented. At that point, you can vote for or against it. Nobody voted against it. So the report of the special select committee brought a bill that was passed at its second reading to the House for its third reading. It doesn't really matter what the numbers are. At the third reading, the procedure is, so, so the first mistake that the opposition made, regardless of what the numbers was, is that they did not use their option 
to stop the vote when the report of the Special Select Committee was presented. They had a second opportunity during the third reading. The Speaker then had the bill presented for its third reading. The Speaker had not put the question because the Speaker knew that he does not have an option and the government does not have an option. The, the question would have to be put. Uh, even if the government wanted to go to recommit the bill, somebody had to move a motion to suspend the standing order. The opposition knew that. They did not want to recommit. They wanted that vote. And so neither the speaker nor the members of the PPPC could have stopped it at that point. So that's the answer. But you know, let me just make a point here for the benefit of the media. I had an experience where I visited someone who was badly brutalized by their spouse and I visited with them at the hospital. And when the, hus when the husband came, this is what he said to the wife. You see what you make her do? Your mouth too hot. If your mouth didn't so hot, I wouldn't have beat you up. He brutalized the woman and he turned around and says, You see what you make I do? If your mouth didn't so hot, I wouldn't have to hit you. There could be no justification for such behavior. The opposition can't come to the people of Guyana and say, See what you make her do? If you only put the bill, I wouldn't have to vote against it. There could be no explanation for this travesty that has been demonstrated here. This thing has deep despotic and un authoritarian underpinnings. It clearly demonstrates that the opposition does not feel accountable and responsible to a Guyanese constituency. They do whatever they want, whenever they want. You're asking me? I'm me. As far as I know, and, and I don't know much, um, as far as I know, Minister Rohi is still under observation and is expected to be released today. Can you say what it is that um, is affecting him? I can just say that Minister Rohi did not have a stroke. All of us don't feel well sometimes, and sometimes we do need to see a doctor. And that was the case here. Yes. Let me just say this to you. First of all, it is not the People's Progressive Party and the government only saying that. The Private Sector Commission, the businesses of Guyana are saying that. The diplomatic community is saying that. But the authority that has been tasked with oversight and ensuring proper rules and regulations are followed which is the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, have said that unless this happens, these are the consequences. Already, banks have decided that they will make it more difficult for financial transactions. That means businesses that must do financial transactions internationally will have greater difficulty doing that business. 
It means that people who want, ordinary people, who want to make money transform. See, there was a time in Guyana, you just go and you transform money. Nobody asks you anything. Then, after 2007, you had to do things like make sure you have ID cards, etc., etc. No, you will have other things to do so that life will become more difficult. And even if life isn't stopped, the job of the National Assembly is to make people's lives easier, not more difficult. And the passage of this bill, of this amendment bill, would have allowed our businesses, our people, to do financial transactions within the rules and regulations of people. Insurance companies, see insurance companies deal a lot with other insurance companies abroad. They reinsure. And therefore, those transactions come to a halt. And so it is not what the PPPC says. We would hope, honestly, genuinely, very <laughs> sincerely we would hope that the consequences do not impact on the lives of our people. We are merely going on what the rules and regulations call for and what CFAT itself has told the nation, not only tell the president and the minister of finance, but told the nation. So I think that when we work on this premise, that that's what you guys said, we ain't saying nothing. We are simply saying that it is, this is what we have been told, that Guyana risk these consequences if we don't do this. It is therefore in the national interest for us to do this. That's all we are seeking to do. That's all we are seeking to do. So when people say, no, y'all making up a story, we ain't make up no story. The people who say we are doing this, we are mongering and so, they have made up a story because the facts are clear. Is there a instruction from CFAT? They have their, it in writing. So we are responding to that. For anyone to stand up and say, no, and in fact, Mr. Granite said it on the floor, that we have no obligation as a country to follow what other people say. Well, I will remind him when next he come and say, this is what so-and-so organization say we should do. Because Guyana is part of a global governance system. We belong to organizations like the United Nations and so. It's the global governance system. Every nation works with that. We can't pick and choose when we belong to an, an international governance system. And that's all we're doing. But I, I, I need to address this, Abina. Because what you're actually saying is that the opposition has been able to spread and create this delusion. This thing is not as bad as they're really saying it is. It's scaremongering, it's propaganda. Well, I want to remind all Guyanese of the disappointment that many of us faced when we went to the American Embassy years ago to get a visa to go to America, and we were torn down because of the conduct of others who got visas and went and didn't come back. We were all considered to be people who wanted to migrate. In this particular instance, because we're not going to be going to be deemed uncompliant, every transaction will be treated as if you're seeking to launder money or financing terrorism. Even when you're going to do a legitimate transaction, you're sending your money to buy container goods to bring it to Guyana, 
to sell it to the people of Guyana. You're sending your money to buy your car. You're doing your online shopping. You're trying to pay for your exam fees to do your ACCA in London um, and all the rest of it. Every transaction, because Guyana will not be compliant, will be treated as if you're seeking to launder money and finance terrorism. So you will have to prove that that is not your intent. And in seeking to prove that, you're going to answer the 46 questions. You're going to have to fill up the 13 forms. You're going to have to provide all the additional information. You're going to have to bring all the various proofs. So the cost of doing business becomes more expensive. There are significant delays, and you'll have to spend lots more money. So don't let nobody come and hoodwink us. It's going to just be a run in the park. It's not a run in the park. Ask any country who have been blacklisted what their citizens have to go through. And you're an investigative reporter, and you can do that. All right, two last questions you're taking. Anybody? Yes, that would you. This is a PPPC press conference. Always, you're always avoiding me when I'm trying to get you to answer this one question so that's like 195,000 tons. Okay. I'm never avoiding you. Okay. Next. Last. No, Are no, I, I wanted to make sure that because those things take its own life. I've never avoided you. Okay. There's no question. Thank you very much.